Hello. When I got into technical diving, I spent a lot of time not really having any idea what a technical dive actually looks like. What you do, why you do it, why the equipment works the way that it does, why you bring the things that you do bring and don't bring the things that you don't. It was very difficult, even with the training material, for me to figure out what a dive like this is actually supposed to look like. And there are not a lot of complete videos of them. There are videos that show the start, the gear setup, all the way through the dive. I thought it would be nice, now that I have the ability, even, albeit somewhat poorly, to film a dive like this to show what it really looks like to do a technical dive with technical diving equipment. Today I am in Chuk Lagoon in Micronesia. It's maybe the most incredible wreck diving site on Earth. I'm on a live aboard boat, which is a boat that you live aboard for about a week and dive off of, in this case the Odyssey. And I'm on the dive deck preparing all of my gear, getting ready to dive in Chuk. Chuk Lagoon was at one point the second largest Japanese naval base during World War II. It was only second to Tokyo. It's a beautiful protected atoll that represents the best possible natural place to secure and supply military ships that maybe you could find in the Pacific. At the time that the Allies bombed it in February of 1944, almost all of the military ships had left basically ran away, and left a lot of merchant ships and supply ships. The ship we're diving today is the Haiyan Maru. This is a postcard of it. As you can see, it's pretty pretty for a military ship, and that's because it started its life as a passenger liner built by the Japanese in 1930. The Japanese spent a lot of time building up their seafaring fleet leading into World War II, partially to build up their economy and partially because they firmly expected to enter into a world war. The high end was converted into a submarine tender. During World War II, submarines played a huge role, but they were small, and they didn't have the equipment, and supplies, and food to last very long in the open ocean. Submarine tenders did contain all of that equipment, along with maintenance personnel and repair equipment, and would follow the submarines around the world, making sure that they were supplied and equipped to actually attack. Today, when we're on the ship, we're going to see a lot of that equipment, including periscope tubes that were meant to replace broken or damaged tubes inside submarines. The Haiyan is the longest rack in all of Chuk. It's 510 feet long, and it doesn't lie particularly deep, between 40 and 120 feet. That makes this a nominally technical dive. It's not exceptionally technical, but we will spend some time inside the rack, and we'll spend longer on the dive than you probably could in a traditional recreational setup. I'm about to do a buddy check, and while I do it, you're going to get a good look at the type of gear that we're bringing into this dive. We are diving a backplate and wing setup. Backplate and wing is a little different than the recreational BC that almost all of us learn to dive on. A recreational BC combines our buoyancy in a nice jacket vest type thing with a zipper in the front with some sort of unit that holds a single tank behind our back. Unfortunately, it's not the easiest thing in the world to manage the type of redundancy that we need for a dive like this with a rig like that, and it's not all that comfortable. So instead, we take a metal plate, called a back plate, and we put nylon webbing through it. And that nylon webbing holds it onto our shoulders and onto our waist. Then onto that metal plate, we mount our buoyancy compensator. It's sometimes called a wing. It's kind of a flat BC that you fill with air and release air from using a hose, just like any other BC that you might use. And then behind the wing, you put your tanks. In our case, we're bringing doubles, double tanks, two complete gas tanks with a manifold between them that allows them to share air from one side of the tank to the other. And there are two big advantages for bringing doubles. One is we can bring more gas. In our case, we're bringing two aluminum 80s, so we have double the gas of a normal recreational diver. The other big advantage is with two tanks, we can set up two complete regulator setups. So instead of just having an octo as a backup, we have a backup first stage and a backup second stage. So if anything should go wrong, maybe our first stage should start bleeding air or one of our second stages should start free flowing or explode or who knows, we can reach behind our back, close a valve, and have the ability to continue to breathe. The isolation manifold that connects the two sides of the tanks means that we don't have to manually balance gas during the dive or worry that one side might be lower than the other or that we might run out of gas on one side. But it does have a valve 
in the middle of the manifold that we can also reach behind our backs. And that allows us to separate the two tanks in an emergency if something truly catastrophic were to happen so that one tank losing all of its pressure wouldn't cause the other side to lose its pressure as well. That type of emergency is incredibly rare, so we keep that isolation manifold open almost all the time. But we will practice closing it during the dive just to make sure that we can should an emergency occur. You also can see a deco bottle, a smaller bottle full of a different gas attached to the left front of our rigs. That deco bottle is to make our decompression stops faster. And we're going to talk more about what the purpose of that is during the deco phase of the dive. We also have two dive computers. That's because we are relying on dive computers during this dive, and we want to make sure that should one fail, we still have the information that we need. We also have equipment for finding our way inside the wrecks. Strobes, which allow us to illuminate our way back out as we go in, and also reels to let us lay line inside the wreck, should we choose to, so we can follow back out in an emergency. We also have backup masks, uh, emergency SMBs, if we were to lose the boat for some reason. And we also have our octo, our secondary regulator, necklaced around our neck. You can see it hanging right there. The purpose of that is to make sure that it is always close should we need it in an emergency. Our primary regulator is attached with a long hose, a seven foot long hose that lets us share air even if we have to pass out of the rack single file. The amazing luxury and beauty of a liveaboard like this is you basically wake up where you're diving. So in this case, we roll out of bed, get our gear on, and then we walk off the back of our hotel, basically, and we find ourselves over the wreck, the high-end maru. The strange construction you start to see materialize in front of you is the ladder to get back onto the boat and a deco bar a bar that hangs off the back of the boat at about 15 feet to make it a little bit more comfortable to do the last deco stop. You may see on the left the elevator, which is a special feature of this particular boat that allows you to get back on the boat without having to climb the ladder. It's literally an elevator. That cable that you see is the small boat mooring. When small boats come out to the wreck from the land-based dive sites, someone dives off the front of the boat and hooks a line through that small boat mooring in order to keep their smaller boats in the right spot. Somewhat amazingly, I'm already at the wreck because it is so very shallow, and I'm futzing with my light mount. In technical diving, lights go from being a kind of fun, optional thing to bring with you on a recreational dive to very, very important because we're often entering environments that are dark and where if you don't have light, you could get seriously lost. So we bring a primary light, and then we also bring backup lights with us as well. In my case, I'm using a uh, Velcro mount on the back of my hand, and it doesn't work super well. So after this dive, I end up retiring it and uh, swapping it out for a more traditional light mount. So this is a good time to mention that I am not an expert diver. I am at best a novice technical diver and, and diver in general. And so you certainly shouldn't repeat anything that you see here, and I don't attest that any of it is correct. I, I'm learning every single dive. And so the mistakes you see here are probably different than the mistakes I'm making now. In this particular case, I'm a little far away from my buddy coming down. And I see him there, and I signal him with my light. But obviously, in, in all phases of the dive, you should be very close to your buddy should you need to share air. We're now going to rally. We're diving as a team of four. But when you dive as four, it's really two buddy teams. In technical diving, it's not uncommon to dive in a group of three. And that can be safer. But if you're four, you never, never dive as one group. You always dive as two buddy teams. So now I've found my buddy. He's going to turn his light off so that he doesn't blind me. And then we're going to do what's called an S-drill. An S-drill is a safety check of our equipment to make sure that we are ready to enter into an environment where if something goes wrong, we can't go straight to the surface. All of that equipment becomes a little bit scarier, a little bit more important when you're in an environment where a problem is a real problem. So I'm checking him for bubbles and checking him for leaks and all the different parts of his equipment, including that deco bottle. He's about to turn it on for me so that I can see it. The next step in this operation is called a show and stow. It's where we pull out our long hose, that hose that we use to share air if we need to, and we confirm that it's not hooked up the wrong way, under anything, misconnected, such that we really could donate it if we needed to in an emergency. Now that I've checked his deco bottle for leaks, my buddy is going to uh, drop his so that it makes his life a little bit easier as we finish the estrel. I'll drop mine in one second. Again, this is not the world's most 
technical dive. And so we absolutely did not need to bring those bottles. We certainly didn't need to drop them. We're primarily doing all of this for the same reason you might do it, which is to practice so that when we do do deeper and more technical, and more serious dives, it's not, you know, the, the only recent time that we've gone through these procedures. So he's now free of his deco bottle and he's doing his show and stow operation proving that that long hose really can be deployed should it need to be. The next step is what's called a flow check. And the purpose of a flow check is really to make sure that your valves, the three valves on the, on the doubles tanks behind us, are in the configuration that we expect, meaning they're all open, and that we can actually reach them. Because if there was some sort of emergency and bubbles start spewing out of one side of the setup, we want to make sure we can actually reach the valves behind us. So with both hands, we turn both the uh, closest valve to that hand and the center isolation valve, and we make sure that that actually works. Once our flow check is done, I'm going to drop my deco bottle, and I'm putting a strobe on it to make it a little easier to find near the end of the diver, should we need to find it in a hurry. So now you're going to see uh, perhaps my favorite part of any new dive in a new location, or wreck dive, which is... Me having no idea of what is going on or where anything is, or, or, or what I prefer to call exploration. I will now explore various regions of the ship and try to see if there's anything interesting or cool there. <laughs> Because of the amazing beauty of this wreck, I've almost immediately found a really cool hole to hopefully go inside. It seems like it can fit a human being. Immediately, we have to do a risk assessment. We have to decide, can we go in this? Can we fit? Can we get back out? Are we going to kick up everything on the bottom of the wreck when we try? Which is a very real problem. Wrecks and caves are generally filled with a thick layer of what's called silt. Fine degraded particles of everything that used to be inside the ship, and if you accidentally kick them up, you can really damage the visibility. Once we decide we're going to go in, we have to decide how we're going to find our way back out. And that usually involves some combination of a line, which we could follow back out the way that we came, or strobes, which will blink in the spaces that we pass through and make it easy for us to remember which way is out. There are certainly different schools on what the safe way to penetrate a wreck is. There are people who believe that only a direct line is safe, that follow the same protocols they follow in caves. There are other people that believe that you can do a very simple penetration like this with no protection whatsoever, as long as you can see outside the wreck. The dive guides during this trip were making very, very elaborate penetrations, as you can imagine, without anything more than just their memory. Uh, as in so many things in diving, you have to make your own risk assessment, and if you don't have an opinion, you should probably lean towards being exceptionally, exceptionally conservative, because you only get to make one mistake. The high end Maru is tipped onto its port side. It's very common for wrecks that don't have flat bottoms to tip to one side or the other when they sink. Because of that, you can see that everything is transposed to the left. So I just looked down a hallway, and now we are looking down a very beautiful, what what was hallway, and now we see the roof on one side and the floor on the other. Below us are those famous periscope tubes, 50 foot long tubes that replace periscopes on submarines. They were being transported by the ship before it sank, and so they remain in the sea forever. At this point, I'm placing another strobe, and the purpose of that strobe is mostly redundancy. Strobes do flood sometimes, they do fail, and so if we're going to rely on a strobe to lead us back out, it's best to have a backup. There are a lot of different models of strobes. In that case, I placed one that was heavier than water, so it would sit easily on the bottom of the wreck and not move. I'm able to get the strobe out that quickly, if, if you consider it quickly, because it's attached to my rig with a bolt snap. Almost everything in technical diving has a bolt snap attached to it. You usually tie it on with some line, 
and that makes it possible to clip it in places where you want to keep it. Technical diving exists in this funny intersection where you have to carry a lot of gear, but it's also very, very important that that gear doesn't catch on things and drag on things. So we attach a bolt snap to almost everything and use it to keep all of our gear really close to our equipment, very streamlined. I'm now taking photos, and I'm taking photos with a, a camera case called the Kraken that allows me to take my iPhone underwater to, I think, 80 meters. I like that case because I can slide it into my pocket, so I don't have to maneuver a large DSLR camera in environments where it would be a little dangerous if you weren't planning the entire dive around photography. You can see here what those photos actually look like. So we now have one of the best experiences exploring anything, which is a fun hole to potentially poke our head in. So we have a little bit of hand signal communication to decide if we actually want to go in here, and ultimately we decide to go in using a reel to make sure that we can find our way back out to this very well-lit hallway. Now this is the part of the video where I explain to you that we are not trained cave divers. We do not have all of the skill and technique that that would require, and that means we are not that good at using reels. Uh, this, like so many parts of this dive, is training and experimentation. Uh, where we're going here is not necessarily somewhere that everyone would use a reel at all. And so we are using it so that we have a way back out and also so that we have an opportunity to practice using reels. Do not take anything that you see in this video as smart things that you should do. I humbly apologize to all the cave divers who I'm sure are, are throwing up in their mouths right now. I promise to, to do better, get more training, and uh, work real hard. You'll notice here that my hand mount for my light has completely failed and I've just clipped it off to one of the bungees of my dive computer. I didn't think it was a particular safety issue, given that it's still attached to me and I have several other lights, including uh, all the strobes, which can actually be used as, as lights as well. But it certainly was something that had to be replaced after this dive. At this point, my hand passes close enough to my mask that the camera that I'm using, it's called a paralens, it's attached to the side of my mask, makes it look like some sort of horrible scuba accident has occurred, but all is well. So I'm leading, my buddy is following, and you're going to see him make a circular shape with his light and me make a circular shape to respond. That's the universal light signal for OK. A wagging light back and forth very rapidly is the signal for something is very wrong.
you and I are about to realize that the line is not as taut as I wanted it to be, uh, which is probably, again, very horrifying to cave divers. And that, to me, is a signal that we have reached the limit of this penetration, and it's time to turn around. So I signaled my buddy a, a rotating single finger, which means turn around, and I start reeling my line up. I secretly really like the way that my light is mounted, uh, where it's clipped off to my wrist, because it means all I have to do is drop the light, and I get enough illumination to see what I'm doing, but I don't blind my buddy. It's very similar to how some people will actually clip their light off to one of their shoulder rings, so that it illuminates their work as they do anything with their hands, but it's one less step, nothing to clip off. Unfortunately, you as an audience member are the one who suffers because without a light in my hand, it's very difficult for the camera to see anything that's going on. It does create this very fun, eerie wreck dive experience, though, that I'll, I'll allow you to enjoy. The E.T.-esque experience of those lights in the distance are actually our other two divers uh, going on their own exploration of the same hallway at a slightly different location than we're at. As you can see, these dives in the Pacific are very much warm water dives. Uh, it says 29C in the corner. Most of our dives were about 84 degrees Fahrenheit in the water. So we just wore one and a half mil wetsuits, two-piece wetsuits actually, a separate top and bottom, which makes them really easy to put on and take off, and, and none of us were ever particularly cold. The gloves that I'm wearing are utility gloves, like you would get at the hardware store, and they're really for abrasion protection. I'm also wearing a, a one and a half mil hood for the same reason. In, inside a wreck, you could really hit your head or scrape your hand accidentally on something, and it's, it's no fun to have a, a festering wound in the Pacific. So we wear those very lightweight gloves that are much more dexterous than the, than the five male gloves we might wear in Monterey, California. And you can see me sort of pushing against things here to try to get uh, the actual line off. That's not ideal, don't do that. Generally, you shouldn't have to uh, hold yourself on anything or certainly ever pull the line in order to get it un unhooked. So do not do as I do, please. Learn as I have. So we've come back up to the hallway that contains those periscope tubes, and you can see how easy the strobes make it to orientate ourselves and, and make sure that we're going out the way that we came in. They're very bright, even in daylight, and so it makes it really easy to know that you're going the right way.
So my buddy clips off the strobe here to his D-ring, but it doesn't quite turn all the way off. It's pretty common underwater for the strobes to be slightly too far twisted and for them to either keep themselves on or, or turn themselves on when you go underwater. So it just needs to be unscrewed a tiny bit more. Now, obviously, we're very close to the exit, but generally removing the strobe if you're the first diver is a mistake, and that, and that was a mistake on this dive. Uh, the last diver should always clean up the line and should always be the one who removes the strobes. One of the counterintuitive things from our advanced rec training is that Superman position, where you stick your arms out as far as you can and lengthen your body in order to make it through an obstruction like that. And look, our buddies, our, our partners in diving, have arrived through the same hole that we entered in. You can get a really clear shot here of what those doubles look like, what the isolation manifold looks like, and what that wing looks like. You can also see the two SMBs he has below his tanks. Those SMBs are inflatable tubes. You can inflate them underwater or you can inflate them at the surface, and they let ships know, boats know, where you are, so that if for some reason you couldn't ascend up the anchor line that we descended on, maybe you lost the ship underwater, you could make sure that a boat on the surface can find you and keep track of where you are. It becomes really important in technical diving to have them because you may be underwater for a while doing decompression stops, and during that time you will drift very far away from the ship. If you don't have the ability for the boat to follow you as you do your deco, you may come up and find that there's no boat there to pick you up. We always carry at least one SMB because you never know when you may not be able to find a line to do your deco on. In dives where we intend on actually using an SMB, we'll often carry two so that we can send two SMBs up the same line to signal some sort of emergency, some reason why we might need someone to dive down and maybe bring us more gas. Some people also use a different color SMB for that. Maybe yellow is emergency and orange is always good. We've now had a chance to come down off of our lovely penetration into the wreck and have a little bit of communication and decide that maybe we want to explore further down in the other direction. We have plenty of gas because of those doubles and because the wreck is so shallow. So we clip on another strobe and we begin to descend through the hallway that was once along the side of the ship. So there was one piece of communication we forgot to have. This looks like the side of a ship, but it actually is a hole. It descends down deeper into, into the sea. And so we needed to communicate on what the maximum depth that we actually wanted to go to was. On this dive, I am diver one. I'm the diver who's in charge. And that's very valuable to have a role to know what you're supposed to do, whether you're supposed to be the person in front or the person behind. Usually we rotate those roles between dives, but on any individual dive, it makes it so much easier to know what to do when you have a specific job, a specific role. And that's one other difference between this kind of diving and recreational diving.
it's incredibly fun to get to actually see what's down all these passages. But we didn't have a line to the surface here, we only had that strobe, and so it didn't make sense for us to go much further than where we could easily see our way back out. As I ascend, you can see all of the beautiful doors that once led from this promenade into the ship itself. They're now just door frames, door kind of grids. They probably were once filled with wood or maybe even glass. You can see just how fun it would be to just spend weeks and weeks and weeks diving just this wreck, going inside all of these holes and seeing where the crew slept and where food was cooked and where the engine runs and all of the incredible spaces that people lived on, both when it was a passenger liner and when it was a military ship. So now it's time to coordinate what we're going to do next, but not without a high five first, obviously. Uh, my buddy signals that we should swim around the perimeter of the wreck, getting a better look at it as we use up the rest of our dive time. It has become very clear that the light is not happy for a variety of reasons. So I debug it a little bit while I experiment with other lights and decide if I want to switch. One of the most shocking things about the wrecks in Chuuk is just how covered in life they are. You'd think that a shipwreck is just a hunk of metal, but for whatever reason, they've formed reefs that are just much more verdant and successful, even than the natural reefs in the area. 
some of the racks are just incredible. You can spend an hour looking at a single square meter and just see so many fish and so many coral. It's, it's incredibly beautiful. My camera is tuned for the color temperature of my lights so that it, it looks uh, pretty re reasonable when we're inside the rack and things are illuminated with flashlights. But outside, you'll see everything tinted blue or green, and that's just a function of the wavelengths of light that get absorbed by the water. So at this point in the dive, we're starting to really look at our time remaining underwater. And that time is really bound by two factors. One is how much gas do we have? Obviously, like any sport dive, if our gas fell below a critical number, we would want to get out of there. And more importantly, how much deco obligation do we have? The, this dive has been so shallow that it's unlikely. It's very much, if any. But on a deeper dive, it would be really important to start looking at our dive computers to see what our total deco time is from this point forward what's known as the time to surface, how long it will take for us to ascend and complete all of our deco stops. Because we have to have enough gas with a very healthy reserve, at least a third of our tank, to complete all of those deco stops. That third is really important because if someone else were to lose their gas, I want to make sure that I have enough gas to share with them through that entire deco procedure. We are using shearwater computers, and those computers give us a really important number called the at plus five. And the at plus five says, if we stayed at this depth for five more minutes, how much deco time would we have? What would our time to surface be? Before the dive, we take the time to sit down and run deco plans for what we think the dive is going to look like, how much gas we have. Based on that, we figure out what the run time of the dive can be, how long we can spend underwater. We usually write those numbers down on a slate on our wrists. Now, if everything has gone exactly to plan, then we want to start ascending right when our time to surface plus the current elapsed time in the dive equals the run time that we've planned for. And if we do that, we're almost certainly going to have the right amount of gas. The dive will last the right duration. If we've spent more time at shallower depths than we anticipated, then when we go look at our time to surface, we'll find out that it's lower than we expected. And so we can actually spend more time on our dive and wait until those numbers add up to our runtime. If we end up going deeper than we expected, then that time to surface is going to climb faster. And we're actually going to see it plus our elapsed time equal the runtime sooner, and we have to ascend more quickly. We're able to do all of this math really, really quickly because ahead of time, we've computed a few numbers, you know, a few different two-minute intervals of where that dive could actually end up, where it could end. And so all we have to do is compare our at plus five number to the numbers that we've written down on our slate, and we immediately know if it's time to turn the dive in the next five minutes or if we have more than five minutes. That allows us to be really, really flexible in our dive planning while always making sure that we hit our runtime. If we do hit our runtime, our gas planning is almost certainly going to be correct. We now spend some time poking around the wreck, looking in holes, finding bottles, discovering all sorts of fun stuff. I'm going to let you watch that and skip myself ahead to about minute 52, where we are starting to leave the wreck, and I'll talk a little bit more about finding our bottles and, and doing our decompression.
And I'm back. So during our exploration, we managed to get pretty far down the ship from where our bottles actually were. So it's a fair bit of swimming along the surface of the ship, which is also the side of the ship, and, and it looks a bit like the seafloor because the ship is just so large, towards where our bottles are. As we get closer, you're going to see the strobe blinking. And I was very valuable to have the strobe there because it meant... I had maybe another minute or two of, of not fear that I was going in the wrong direction or that we had somehow gotten turned around. This is a good time to mention that during this dive, despite all of my hype, we actually incur almost no decompression obligation. The wreck is just too shallow to get a significant amount of detail in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, I think at this point I have a two minute stop at 10 feet. And what that means is I can't go directly to the surface I have to spend at least two minutes at a depth of 10 feet. If I were to go directly to the surface, there would be a chance, probably not on this dive admittedly, but on a, on a deeper, longer dive, there would be a chance that the inert gas in my tissue would bubble out. And those bubbles can wreak havoc throughout the human body. To prevent that, the dive computer runs a decompression algorithm that makes sure that the pressure difference between the inert gas in my tissue and the ambient air that I'm breathing is never too great. I've set up on my dive computer my personal conservatism factor, my numbers that represent how conservative I'm interested in being in my diving, and it uses those numbers to figure out how long I should spend at various depths. As I said before, it is a little comical that we have any kind of accelerated deco gas, that we have any kind of other bottle on a dive with such a small decompression application. We did plenty of other dives on this trip without those bottles and just using the air on our backs or the, the nitrox on our backs to do our decompression. In this case though, because we are looking to practice, we do pick up our bottles and we will switch gases to that accelerated deco mix. In this case, the bottles are full of EAN50. That means 50% of the gas in the bottle is nitrogen, and 50% is oxygen. That's different than air that we normally breathe, where 21% is oxygen, 78% or so is nitrogen, or the gas we're breathing on our backs in this dive, which is 32% oxygen. Generally, we want that higher oxygen number, remember it's 50% for those deco bottles, because it means there's less nitrogen. And if there's less nitrogen, more of the nitrogen in our tissue will get a chance to escape more quickly. The higher our oxygen is, the more quickly our body will be able to force that nitrogen out and shrink and eliminate any bubbles that are within our, our tissue. Obviously, these bottles can fail. They only have single regulators on them, for example. And we also could potentially not find them. So it's very important that we always have enough gas on our backs to complete our dive should we need to. Uh, if we weren't dropping bottles or we had multiple bottles, it's possible that we would only plan to fa allow one bottle to fail. Now, normally this would be when you actually did the gas switch to the deco bottle, but our deco obligation was so slight at this point that we decided it made more sense to keep the bottles full for our next dive and, and not require another, another fill on the boat, which is a pretty laborious operation. It just isn't worth it for two minutes of breathing, and it makes more sense to have that gas on our next dive that, that could be significantly deeper. Because our deco obligation is so small, it's a pretty easy operation today. We don't have to, to do free deco where we float in space, or we don't have to do deco with an anchor line. We just go right up to that bar that's off the bottom of the ship that we're also living on and hang out there at 15 feet we will complete our deco, obviously, and then we'll probably spend a few more minutes there. Uh, one of our instructors is famous for saying the only cause of the bends is not doing enough deco. And so if we have enough gas and we have the time, it doesn't hurt to allow our, our gradient factor, the amount of inert gas, gas in our tissue, to fall even further before we get out of the water. Hanging off the bottom of the deco bar, you see emergency regs. The boat stations a uh, bottle of Nitrox 32 with extra regs on it hanging off the back of the boat just in case someone needed to breathe it in an emergency.
One thing I never thought about is just how crazy of a ride hanging onto a bar off the bottom of a boat could be. But the boat is anchored at its bow at the front. And the stern is where this deco bar is. And so the boat swings back and forth pretty aggressively as the current takes it and the wind takes it. And that means you swing pretty <laughs> aggressively. It's, it's kind of a, a rodeo-esque experience. As we hang off the back of this boat like idiots, it's worth talking about how you can get into technical diving, how you can get the gear and get all of the training and actually do diving like this, or, or hopefully diving that's both more skilled and, and more dramatic than this. The gear, you just have to buy. As you get into technical dive, it's really not an option in most places to rent this kind of equipment. We were able to rent the tanks. It's becoming more and more common that you can rent uh, double tanks like this in a lot of locations, and the boat was happy to provide us with, with these tanks because that obviously is something that's very difficult to move around the world. Everything else we brought with us in a suitcase and we use for diving in Monterey, California and in the other places that we've gone. And it just becomes very necessary to customize the gear towards your body and the way that you dive and to know that your gear works. On a recreational dive, if you get a crappy regulator, you know, it might be a little annoying. But on a technical dive, if the regulator fails, it could be a serious problem. So it just isn't really acceptable to be using equipment that you're not very, very familiar with in technical diving. It's, it's just too dangerous. So you do have to own all of your own equipment. It's amazing, though, how quickly you accumulate it and extra equipment and duplicate equipment and all sorts of other equipment once you get deep in the sport. The training really starts at some sort of introduction to tech diving, some way or experience where someone can teach you how to use doubles maybe how to use a dry suit if you dive in a cold environment and really get you familiar with using the equipment, carrying it on your back, dealing with the different buoyancy and adjustments. It, it takes a little bit more work to adjust this type of equipment and so having some time to do that is a really good call. In our case, it took at least a year of pretty consistent weekend diving for us to feel at all comfortable in the equipment because there were just so many little adjustments we had to make between every dive. That could have happened much faster had we done a few weeks straight in the water, but it's worth remembering that it will take a good amount of time. After you do that and you are comfortable, you can take a deco procedures course or a extended range course and really start to learn all of the procedures, the science, and tune, fine tune your buoyancy and your trim. Obviously, that's something that we are still learning, and particularly I am still learning. Um, and probably will be for the rest of my life, but you do have to have pretty solid buoyancy skills because you are entering an environment where you both could cause serious harm if you're not able to maintain your trim and buoyancy inside a wreck or inside a cave, and you could miss a deco stop if you can't correctly arrest an ascent, and that could be very dangerous. So those skills become really important, and tech instructors will really help you develop those skills a lot. You also get to learn new finning techniques that don't lift up silt and allow you to fin backwards, which is really, really convenient. And you get to explore places where other people can't go. Whether that's the inside of a ship or, or deep in a cave where I haven't been, or even deeper underwater into places that people just can't see unless they've had this training. And it makes diving a more intense activity, a more detailed and more nuanced activity that has more planning and more organization around it. And if those things are exciting to you, then it can make diving go from a fun hobby you do a few times a year to a really, really deep passion that's a big part of your life. The majority of divers, obviously, are not interested in that. They're not interested in, in the danger of it because you can make mistakes that will lead to your death in a way that's pretty difficult in recreational diving. They're not interested or, or don't have the funds for the expense. Or they just don't think it sounds fun to, to make diving such a difficult thing. They want diving to be simple. Uh, and all of that makes perfect, perfect sense. Technical diving is never going to be the most common or popular way that people scuba dive. It really has to be something that gets you excited for, for it to be the right thing for you. I do think the converse is true, too. I think there are a lot of people who take recreational diving courses and they're, they're disappointed. 
and they don't see the depth and they don't see the nuance and, and di they almost fall off of diving or they only do dive a few times a year. And if they knew that this tech world was available to them and that there is so much more depth and science and medicine and nuance, risk assessment, training, technique available in diving, it would appeal to them a lot more. So I think it's very important that the people who are destined for technical diving do hear about it and understand what it is. The other big training that we did get for doing this kind of diving is an advanced wreck course. Uh, doing your own penetration into a wreck without a guide is dangerous and you can get lost and there are plenty of people who have died inside wrecks. So learning how to use lines, learning how to use strobes, learning how to navigate if you can't see or if your equipment is damaged is all a really, really good idea. Learning how to move through spaces, unentangle yourself, get through restrictions, all good training to get. That's a very good idea. Thank you for watching this dive, and I hope you enjoyed it at least as much as we did when we were there. Chuuk is an incredible place. Diving is an incredible hobby, and, and technical diving has, no pun intended, dramatic depth that, that I'm, I'm nowhere close to the edge of. It has been a very fun journey, though. After the next few minutes of deco, we're going to get out of the water. Uh, I'll use the elevator, which is not something that exists anywhere else or you should ever expect on a dive but is a lovely perk and then we will set down all of our gear get it all cleaned up and then uh, refill tanks and get ready for the next dive please uh, subscribe if you want more of these videos I'll, I'll post more over time